I'm Wally Wood. We welcome you to this next issue of the Revelation File Report. Last time I was with you, I took you into the story of Moses at the Red Sea. And we read some things in the report, in the scriptures, that uh, are not familiar with a lot of people. And uh, that over the years that I've talked with other teachers, I've mentioned some of these elements that I mentioned last time, and it surprised them because they had not seen it before either. So as kind of a, a back review for those of you who are tuning in now that didn't pick up our previous report, I wanted to review with you once again this hallmark story in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, of the encounter that Moses had with the Lord at the Red Sea. We're going to go to Exodus chapter 14, where the story is, is anchored, and we're going to start with verse 13, because this was the pivotal point of that entire experience. Reading from verse 13 in the New American Standard Bible, Moses said to the people, now keep in mind, he, they were already complaining about the whole situation they found themselves in, all right? They're at the Red Sea. They have not crossed over yet. Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you this day. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Now, if we can just pause right there. Put yourself in that story, in that situation. The Red Sea was too large, too deep for them to swim across. About anywhere from 3 million to 6 million slaves. Chances are they probably did not know how to swim. That was not the, the social culture at the time. So <clears throat> he's got all these people angry at him. He's got this impossibility in front of him. And he stands there and puts forth this powerful statement of faith. It's a setup because he doesn't know what's going to happen next. But what gets my attention in this whole story is what follows that particular statement in verse 13. Verse 14, well, actually, he goes on to say that the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Verse 15, then the Lord said to Moses in response, why are you crying out to me? Stop right there. That is a rebuke. God is rebuking Moses <clears throat> for this statement of faith that Moses just put forth to the people of Israel. Why are you crying out to me? He goes further to say, Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. As for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and you divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. We have, a, we have a problem here. Moses is very human. He finds himself in a situation that unless God does something, we're doomed. Then God comes back and says, you do it. Now, I don't know about you and your theology, but this captures my attention. It says to me that God is now bringing Moses to a higher point than perhaps even Moses himself has ever been. And he's telling Moses to do this, to do the impossible. Why? We'll ask, answer that question in just a moment. Look what follows. Verse 17. As for me, behold, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh and the Egyptians, so that they will go in after you. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Moses finds himself between the proverbial rock and a hard place. He's got this impossible body of water with the challenge of not being able to swim across. He's got this king chasing after him with his entire Egyptian army, and God says, I'm going to harden their hearts and send them in fast after you. Have you ever been in that situation? I know I have, where what is before you are not options that you would choose. 
Why did he rebuke Moses? Why did not the Lord commend him for the statement of faith that he made in verses 13 and 14? All I can say is what, what I see in the Scriptures. The Scripture says that God looks upon the heart. Man looks on the outside. God looks on the inside. And apparently the Lord was not impressed or convinced by what Moses had said. The only options I see, faith or hope. Where did that prayer come from? Where did that statement of faith come from? How did God hear it? He heard it from a man who apparently was befuddled, concerned, maybe even scared. He had never been in a situation like this before. And instead of making this prayer and this statement in fullness of faith, he spoke it more in hope. And that's not what the Lord is listening for. Faith is the, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's the substance of things hoped for. This is a lesson for all of us. As we are growing and maturing in our walk before the Lord, we abandon prayers of hope. And we rely more strictly on prayers of faith. What's the difference? I think you can tell the difference. Hope is an anticipation, expectation. Faith is a declaration. This is how it will be. Now, it takes a major change in us to make that crossover. Hope, capture this, there's an element of fear and doubt in hope. Maybe this will work, maybe not. I don't know. Faith says it will happen this way. God was correcting Moses at this very critical point in his own maturity. As I mentioned in our previous program, Moses had already gone through the plagues of Egypt. God had rendered him powerful in those plagues. Whatever came out of Moses' mouth, that is what the Lord fulfilled in the way of those plagues. If you can envision Moses, like us, a maturing believer unto the times in which he found himself. He was anointed and appointed to go into Pharaoh after having spent all those years, 40 years in the wilderness as a man being broken and humbled. In the fullness of time, he had the burning bush experience. The time was now right. God is in control. God's the manager of it all. He knows when we are ripened and prepared for the next step. And he told Moses at the burning bush, I will never leave you. I will always be with you. Now go. And he proved it every step of the way. Now, please hear this because, and, and see this in your own walk. He prepared Moses every step of the way, and they grew in partnership. They became friends. Now, he's brought to the ultimate test. What will you do now, Moses, given the success of your past? What now must you do? <clears throat> when you live your life in a pattern of miracles and not one miracle has failed you, you are expected to come to a certain point in your maturity as Moses was right here and now. Why did God rebuke him? Because he was failing to take that, take that next step in assurance and certainty, and confidence, and command. How do I know? Because of what God just told him. You put forth your arm, you put forth your rod, and you divide the, Moses, uh, the water, Moses. You tell the people to go forth on dry ground even before you do that. You tell them they're going to go across on dry ground. Have I ever failed you yet? 
Have I ever rejected what you have commanded? Why are you stopping now? Why are you clueless now? When everything is on the line, there's more at risk now than you had back there in Egypt before you draw, drew the people out. Why are you failing now? And he told Moses, you divide the waters. What happens next? Verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind. Stop right there. Moses obeyed. God answered. Jesus, our prime example of faith. For all the ministry that Jesus did, in the Gospel of John, at least four times he summed it up by saying, I do nothing of my own initiative. I, see, I do what I see. I say what I hear. Take this back to Moses. Moses, what are you left with? You have this entire history of kingdom performance in your legacy. What think ye? Samuel tells Saul, when the Spirit comes upon you, whatsoever seemeth right unto thee to do, do it, for the Spirit is with you. Do you see the interconnection here? Jesus fulfilled it by saying, I am a man of faith, just like you. That's what Jesus was. He gave the perfect definition of what faith is. Seeing and hearing and obeying and trusting. That is faith. Jesus modeled it. Moses is about to learn it to the nth degree. He put forth his rod. He divided the waters with God's power. When they get to the other side, God says, now put forth your rod and bring the waters back. Moses obeyed, and the Lord brought the waters back. To the mature believer, there comes a point in the course of our maturity when the Lord says to us, as he did to Moses, get off my lap. Stand by my side. We've got work to do. From this point forward, we're partners. I am at work within you. I've given you a new mind, a new heart. Now, whatever seems right for you to do under the circumstances, under these conditions, you speak it, I'll back you up. It's hard for us to get there because we see our own failure as faith walkers. There are so many different directions I can carry this, but I'm delivering to you what I feel the Lord wants me to bring at this very hour, at this very moment, because of world conditions being what they are now, and the challenges are going to be getting more increased around us. I shared with you a few programs ago, Sons of Royalty, that when you have a ruling royal, you have no need for a parliament. Because what proceeds out of the mouth of the royal is parliamentary. In the world of the spirit, Jesus, remember on the last day, well, on the, on the first day of Jesus' resurrection. Remember, he saw Mary. He told her to touch him not. He had not yet ascended to the Father. About eight hours later, he shows up in the upper room. The disciples are there through fear. He says, peace be unto you. The next thing he says to them, now receive ye the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he breathed upon them, and they all received. It doesn't actually say they received it, but we are left with that impression that's exactly what happened. That as he breathed upon them, they received the Holy Spirit. They were saved for the first time at that moment. Then, the next thing he said to them was the verse, very first sermon their newly renewed ears had heard. He said, now, 
Whosoever sins you rescind, they are rescinded unto them. And whosoever sins you retain are retained. Without any further commentary, he left the room, leaving them with this statement. I'll tell you what it says to me in the context of a maturing saint walking by faith. Sons of royalty. Now, heaven and hell await your judicious proclamations. Whosoever sins you rescind, they are rescinded unto them. Who, whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. The word is not rescind, it's remit. I apologize. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. That puts the power of authority upon the sons of royalty. It places the power of authority upon the sons of royalty. Moses, you have now reached the point where you no longer have to pray and hope. You now have the authority to speak forth what seemeth right unto thee to do. Even if it seems out of the ordinary, unorthodox, if it's firmly established within your heart, it's me putting it there. Now speak it, and I will do it. Moses didn't have the power but he had the authority. Coronavirus. We're taping this in the month of March 2020. The plague of coronavirus is worldwide now. And we got Christians shaking in their boots. I work in the retail business, retail industry. I see it every day. You can't tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian at this point in grocery lines. They're all looking the same, signing the same, acting the same. They've all got fear and anxiety. What about the Christians? What about the church? What about those to whom it's been said, you are the light of the world? Why are we not looking different, walking different, talking different, being different? Because the world right now is in total chaos. The spirit of fear has come upon the world. But the scripture says that unto us the spirit of fear has not been given. But of power, love, and of a sound mind. Those three elements right there are part of the environment, the package of authority. I'm not saying that we should stand up and all blare at the coronavirus and say be gone we could but we're not there yet in our maturity package we're barely speaking in terms of love power and of a sound mind and I'm trying to challenge the believer who will be watching this program step up to the next level what is invading your life what are the threats that you're facing. What can you speak into and expect a change? <sighs> All things are possible with God, the scripture says. And we very quickly write that off and say, well, that's with God. In my world, things are impossible. I'm impressed because Paul said that everything that was written beforehand was written for our example so that we would not be committing the same sins that were committed before. They died without having received the promises, Hebrews 11 says. All these people of faith, these dynamic people of faith, did not receive what was promises, promised. Because God had something better reserved for us. That apart from our faith, their faith could not be made perfect. As I said in our previous program, I am the answer to David's prayers. You and I, according to 1 Corinthians, are the harbingers of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. 
we are existing at a, a time in our walk, in our religious life, that David yearned to come into. I wish that I could spend the entire day in your presence, in your temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have within us what David yearned for. They died without having received the promises because God had something better reserved for us. He made us more than conquerors. They were not. He has made us kings and rulers in the now. They were not. It was harder for them than it is for us. I know it, this sounds crazy. Read the scriptures, learn the scriptures, learn the word, collect the dots and connect the dots. Colossians tells us that the devil was rendered powerless at the cross. That tells me that before the cross, he had power. If he's rendered powerless at the cross, that means he had power before the cross. If he's powerless now, why don't we see it? Because this dark world and dark minds give him that power. We who have the authority, remember Jesus went to hell, got the keys, came back and gave it to us. He said, now go forth and destroy the works of the devil. The only reason we're not seeing that powerlessness of the enemy in our lives is because we're giving him power. In our ignorance or in our abstinence, we're giving him the power he needs to be effective in our lives, we being having made, been made more than conquerors. There's a lot that's coming upon the world very, very quickly. We've been talking about these, these plagues for generations. This is the beginning. Jesus said, this is just the beginning of sorrows. Even worse things are coming in the lifetime of the generation that will see his return. In Matthew 24, he said, the generation that sees these things of which I've spoken will not pass away until everything had been fulfilled, and that included his return. This is the generation that will see with its eye the splitting of the eastern sky and the return of our Lord. Jesus raised the question, when the Son of Man returns to earth, will he find faith on the earth? Knowing that he's speaking prophetically of that which was spoken later on, that he's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. Collect the dots and connect the dots. Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. They were all believers. How do I know? Because they were virgins. New creations. New creatures. They were all gathered together in the same place at the same time for the same reason, awaiting the coming of the bridegroom. But in the tearing of his return, or of his coming... They all fell asleep, including the five wise. They stopped watching. They became lethargic, complacent, and the like, apathetic. They stopped watching. They paid attention to everything else. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the, in the day of, of his return. What was it like in the days of Noah? He went on to say, marrying and giving in marriage. What does that symbolize? Life going on as usual. Everybody caught up in their own plans, their own doings, and not paying attention to either the signs of the times or to him personally. Just going about their business. What's he saying to us? What's he trying to get us to hear? I have a friend who a number of years ago had a dream. And in this dream, as he told me later, he saw a large group of people dressed in white robes going up a stairwell, a stairway into heaven. 
a spiral stairway. And he watched and he saw that they got to the very top and couldn't go any further. And he began to focus in on what was it that was keeping them back. There was a door that was not open and they couldn't proceed any further and it bothered him. And he was wondering, Lord, what's this about? Why can they not go any further? They're already in heaven, but why can they not go any further? And so he shared it with me and asked me about it. I told him, I said, well, Solomon said that the path of life leads ever upward for the righteous. They're dressed in white robes, so that means they're righteous, they're saved, they're believers. But their progress is hindered because they've matured to such a point that the next step they take is to enter into the faith of Christ himself. The faith of Jesus. The faith that Jesus walked by. To take one more step in that direction, they are committed from that point on to walk as Jesus walked. To think as Jesus thought. To talk as Jesus talked. To be as Jesus was. And as I've reviewed with you before, 1 John chapter 4, that as he is, so are we in this world. 1 John chapter 2, that a man who says he abides in Christ must also even walk as Jesus walked. Brethren, we've come to that place, both in our personal lives and in history, that requires that we be like Moses found himself being challenged to be. Let us not be rebuked as he was. Whatever is coming upon your household, whatever is coming into your life, Paul said, be circumspect. What does that mean? Pay attention to yourself. Work on yourself. Discipline yourself. Become as Jesus is. Practice speaking into your own circumstances and taking control of it. That's what meek means. The meek shall inherit the earth, those who are under self-control. We'll speak more on these things in our next program coming up. I thank you. We're running out of time. I bless you. I'm Wally Wood. Thank you for tuning in. You have been watching the Revelation File Report with Wally Wood, a Wally Wood Ministries production from Houston, Texas. You are able to support the ministry by donating at wallywoodministries.com and by mail at Wally Wood Ministries, P.O. Box 42005, Houston, Texas 77242. Wally is available to present full two-hour forms in your city called the Revelation File News Forum. For more details, contact Andy Valdez at 713-560-3348 or by email at andy at andyvalidez.com. The Revelation File News Report is a weekly update of global trends in the news as it aligns with end-time Bible prophecy. Tune in again next time, and be sure to like and share this channel.